Good evening, everyone. I'm glad you're here. Appreciate you all tuning us in, and uh, uh, we'll be putting this on uh, YouTube tomorrow morning. So uh, we're averaging a pretty good number every week that are watching it on YouTube, and I appreciate that. And we're going to talk tonight about some of the things we've already been talking about for quite some time. We're going to continue our comparison between what was taught to, by Jesus to the 12 apostles and what was taught by Jesus to the apostle Paul. And uh, remember now that we had a week where we went through what Peter received from the Lord in the sense that he received the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And remember also that we discovered, discovered how the, the kingdom of heaven is only mentioned or described fully in the book of Matthew. And so in the book of Matthew, Jesus said things like, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. And he said things that, like he said to Peter, he, right after telling Peter, I give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. And in Luke chapter 22, I believe it is, just before Jesus went to the cross, he told Peter that Satan hath desired to have you, meaning the whole bunch of them, you being plural, and but he said, but then the Lord said to Peter, but I have prayed for thee, singular, and he says, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And so there was a time yet coming when Peter would be converted. Now, if we transfer that into Acts chapter 2, that thought pattern into Acts chapter 2, we'll find in Acts chapter 2 that the 12 were all in one place, in one accord, and the Holy Ghost fell upon them, and they were all baptized with the Holy Spirit at that time. Now go, if you will, to Acts chapter 1, and we'll get up what Jesus said about that event occurring. Acts chapter 1. In what Jesus said concerning the promise of the Father, he said, but wait for the promise of the Father. Now verse 5, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And if we put our arithmetic caps on, then we would come, come up with about seven more days. Uh, then uh, verse 6, When they therefore were come together, they ask of him saying, this would be they, the apostles, they ask of him saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, Sure. Oh, no, he didn't say that. Oh, he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons, which the Father hath put in his own power, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, which is a direct reference to being baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. How do you know that? Because when you follow it through, you'll see that the twelve had great power. Jesus told them that he, greater things than he had done, they would do. And that's fine. All you have to go to to his Romans, I mean, in his Acts chapter 5, to see that that is true. When the Lord Jesus Christ spoke and exerted the power of God that was in him in all of his ministry, he never did cause anyone to die. Peter walked in or had a conversation with two people in Acts chapter 5, and they died because of the words that came out of his mouth. I'd say that's a notable difference than what Jesus did. Now, when they said, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to, to Israel? And Jesus did not give them an answer of that. But the bigger question is, why did they ask that question? Well, because in the 40 days just prior to this, just prior to them asking Jesus that question, in the previous 40 days, they had been told by the Lord everything that was in the Old Testament. It says that Jesus opened their eyes and taught them the scriptures. The scriptures would have been that scripture. Therefore, there's two or three things they knew back here. They knew there was an eternal promise of God unto Israel back here. They knew also that David was going to be resurrected to be the king set on the throne. They knew also that the 12 tribes would be in that kingdom uh, and I'm going to just put resurrected out here. In other words, not, not 12 new tribes, not 12 tribes of people who are alive and go through the tribulation and on the other, come out on the other side. No, but resurrected 12 tribes of Israel will be in that kingdom. 
They knew this, and they, so they asked the question, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? That would be this kingdom, which they had under Solomon, and under, and under David, and under Solomon. Now, since he said, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons, many people like to question whether or not Jesus knew all about us, the dispensation of grace. And very frankly, I'm hedging my, my uh, statement here. On this side of the cross, after Jesus Christ had gone up and been glorified with the Father, and had come back and spent 40 days with the 12 apostles, and then, and then he <clears throat> comes to this spot here where he goes out on the mountain and is ascended into heaven, at that point, I believe the Lord Jesus Christ knew all about everything that was going to happen. So he gives them the answer, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father put in his own power. I want to show you a type of the same reference. Look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14 through 17, the Apostle Paul has written about what we today call the rapture. Probably not a real good word, but it depicts it pretty well. He says in verse 17, uh, verse, at the end of verse 16, he says there's a time here when the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall ye ever, we ever be with the Lord. Now here's the thing. What the 12 apostles knew about this kingdom over here of Israel that was going to be restored to Israel, he knew that they were, what the 12 apostles knew was that they were all going to be resurrected. Over here, uh, when Paul talks about what we call the rapture here and then says, and then says that uh, the dead in Christ are going to rise first, then we which are uh, alive and remain are going to be caught up with them, then not everybody is going to die. As in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be saved, uh, changed. Uh, now, so there's the people here that are asleep, and they're going to be resurrected, but the rest of us, speaking very optimistically, the rest of us are not going to die before the Lord comes back. For this group of people to be restored, they all have to be resurrected, as in uh, uh, the Valley of Dry Bones in, in Ezekiel 36, and as in the two of the last three chapters of uh, Hosea, I forget those numbers, the resurrection of the dead, emptying their graves. That's those people, and they're going to get it, and it's eternal, and it's an eternal kingdom, and it is promised to them from Abraham forward. Now, in Acts chapter 2 then, go to Acts chapter 2, they are filled with the Holy Ghost, the people wonder at it, and then Peter begins to speak, verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem. In verse 5, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Who was Peter talking to? You men of Judea, verse 14, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem. Now look at verse 22. You men of Israel, hear these words. Then who's he talking to? The men of Israel. Now look at the end of his speech. Go to verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. It said all the house of Israel. So I've got the... Men of Judea and all that dwell at Jerusalem on a feast day. In verse 14, the men of Israel in verse 22, and all the house of Israel in verse 36, it'd be very difficult to deny who Peter was talking to here. Now wait, I know that there are some of you right now that would love to say, oh, he's one of those guys. He's going he's gonna to separate Israel from the rest of the world. I don't have to do that, folks. They already were separated from the rest of the world. I'm not doing anything. I was just reading scripture. Now notice, in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer. Most people believe that's around between 3 and 6 in the afternoon. That's okay with me. 
and they go to this temple, and they see a lame man. In verse two, they see a lame man at the at the gate at the um, gate of the temple called Beautiful, and Peter says these famous words to him. They he asked them of them a, a, an alms, and Peter says, uh, verse six. Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man did. So, well, yeah, right. Power of an apostle, right? Amen. That's what it is. It's the signs of an apostle. Notice, if you will, verse, um, uh, the people wonder at it and chase around trying to make Peter out to be some big deal. And he begins to talk to them in, in verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, you men of Israel, who's he talking to here? Oh, yeah, he's in the temple in Jerusalem, still talking to Israel. You men of Israel, why marvel you at this? Or why look you so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Peter just told this crowd of people, if they hadn't already heard about it, that the same bunch that was speaking in tongues on the day of Pentecost, just one chapter earlier, the same bunch who were preaching the condemnation to the men of Israel for having killed the Prince of Glory, were now doing it again. You denied him, he said. Verse 17. And now, brethren, I walked it through ignorance. You did it, as did also your rulers. All of a sudden, there's an humiliation by Peter toward these people because Jesus said, all manner of sin should be forgiven men including sinning against the Son of Man. So they sinned against him, they had him killed, and yet, he says, you did it through ignorance. Keep reading. Verse 18, But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Before we go any further, let's go over here to, let's see, I'm going to bring blue over here. So from this message, Acts chapter 3, comes a hope and a promise of something that is going to occur Obviously, we could say, yet in the future. That promise that is yet to occur is referred to as the second coming of Christ, is referred to as his coming in the clouds of great glory. And he's coming down to where these people, these right here, they are going to receive th something from him when he comes down. Notice this. Verse 19, repent you therefore and be converted, watch now, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ. Well, here comes Jesus. And their sins will be blotted out. I'm going to say in this parenthesis mark right here, I'm going to say Acts 3, repentance. A-N-T-S, right? Repentance. Close enough. These people get their sins blotted out. Why? When? When Christ comes back. Let's read it again. Verse 18, uh, 19 rather. Repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ. Which before was preached unto you whom they killed back up there in the earlier passage. Verse uh, 21. Whom Jesus Christ, whom the heaven must receive. That's where he is. He went up here. And Acts chapter 1. Whom the heaven must receive 
until the times of restitution of all things. Well, if we start right there, and we come way over here, I'm going to draw just a little tiny downward blue line right here. Jesus Christ has got an appointed day coming down here, and one of the things that he's going to do when he gets here is he's going to raise these people from the dead. He's going to forgive their sins and blot them out. I didn't make that up. That's what it says. And to them, that is marvelous news. I don't know how many people believe here, but if I keep reading chapter 3, 4, 5, 6, even into 7, I find many, many, many people in Jerusalem and around, right around about, there's churches of Judea there, around about Jerusalem, that are believers on Jesus Christ. They all are in the same category as the chapter 3, verse 19, 20, and 21 folks. They've got no other picture than to say that they, would re they should repent and be converted so that their sins could be blotted out when Christ comes back. I have nothing else to do with them. That is exactly what they were preached. Now, I forget now if it's three weeks ago or four, we went over 21 places where the Bible declares that the apostle Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles. He was the apostle of the Gentiles. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. He was the apostle for the Gentiles, and on and on it goes. Everything that the Gentiles needed to know, Paul had it. And so there's somebody sitting back there that knows something about Acts chapter 10. And they say, well, Peter's first one went to Gentiles. No. He was the only apostle of the 12 to go to a Gentile. And you'd say, you don't know that. Yes, I do, because I have the word of God. And if the Lord wanted me to take note that one of the other 11 went to Gentiles, I believe he would have told me. But it was Peter. Go to Acts chapter 10. So a lot has happened to get to Acts chapter 10. Many things. They've stoned Stephen. Uh, this guy, Saul, who was a murderer and a blasphemer, he got saved. But he's not in this passage. Please notice. Verse 1, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian man. Now watch this guy, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. The Lord Jesus Christ healed on three different occasions, I believe it was, three peop individuals associated with Gentiles. And in one case, in the book of Luke, it is described that this guy was worthy of this because he was like this guy, Cornelius. I've read some commentaries think it was Cornelius. I don't, but nevertheless. It says, he was a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people, which is Israel, and prayed to God all the way, which means all along the way. Everything that he did, whatever he was involved in, he prayed to God. Now he sees a vision, and the Lord tells him to send over to Joppa, and call for a man named Peter, that he might come to him. So he sends his men over to get him. Now notice, if you will, in verse um, uh, 9, on the morrow as they went on their journey, these men going to go get Peter. Uh, and drew near, nigh unto the city, it says, Peter went up, um, up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, which would be noon, and he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, what God hath cleansed. That call not thou common. This was done thrice. And the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now watch. 
Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, he doubted in himself. He doubted. He didn't doubt the Lord. He doubted in himself. In other words, it was be like you or I might say, well, what in the world am I going to, what am I going to do here? What, what, where am I supposed to go? And what, what it is, what is it that I'm, I'm uh, uh, facing here? I don't know what this is. Call not thou common uh, or unclean what God has cleansed. How can I face this? Verse uh, uh, 17. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and said, asked, and asked si whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. That's a tall order for one of the twelve apostles. Two things to consider here. Well, there may be dozens. One, Peter is not in Jerusalem. He's in Joppa. Two, a Gentile has sent for him. And before he knows it's a Gentile that has sent for him, though he had the vision, he knows three men are there to, to uh, seek him, and he's supposed to go with them. He has no idea what he's supposed to do. Notice it says, verse 21, Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom you seek. What is this cause, the cause wherewith, uh, wherefore you are come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man and one that feareth God and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. What do you suppose Peter's thinking right there? He doubted in himself up here earlier. He thought on the vision not knowing what it meant. Now it's a Cornelius, a Gentile, that has sent for him. He doesn't say, all right, good, we get this thing spreading around here. We're going to take the gospel, these guys. That's, is that what he said? No, that wasn't what he said. Verse 24, Peter goes with them. Reverse, just go to 25. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he, Peter, said unto them, are you ready for this? You know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. He's inside one of another nation's house when he said this. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. You know, it's like these guys might be standing there saying, wait a minute, if this had been three days ago, would you have called us common and unclean? I'm not putting words in the mouth there. I'm just saying, think about Peter the man. He doesn't know these Gentiles. But the Holy Ghost told him, go with them, nothing doubting. Verse 29, he goes on. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, in other words, he didn't argue with them, as soon as I was sent for. Now watch, I ask therefore, for what intent you have sent for me? This is Peter, the man with the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and he doesn't know why he's there. Huh. That matter? Yeah, that matters. So Peter tells him the story of how the angel of God showed up. Notice, if you will, in verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, and God was with him. And we are witnesses to all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, 
who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. Now, I want you to think about something. And uh, by the way, uh, uh, verse uh, um, uh, 43, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Hold on there to Acts chapter 10. Go back to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. When Peter stopped preaching, the, the people said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you. One night in here, we went over all the things that are there in Acts chapter 2. They had to repent. They had to get baptized. They had to uh, save themselves from an untoward generation, and they had to sell out and have all things common. Now go back to chapter 10. Oh, oh, remember the, the passage we just read in chapter 3? Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus. Right over here. Now look at this. Verse 43. I'm back in Acts chapter 10, verse 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name or whosoever believeth in him shall have remission of sins. Remission of sins. Oh. Remission of sins in Acts chapter 10, right here, tied to Acts chapter 3, which is tied to Acts chapter 2, and there comes the remission of sins. Oh, to get the remission of sins, you repent, you get baptized, and you uh, save yourselves from an untoward generation, and you sell out. According to chapter 3, you wait until Christ comes back. Wait for Christ. So now you've got the same words in chapter 10, same words spoken by Peter to Cornelius about what he's going to get if he will believe in Christ. Whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Well, the description of getting remission of sins is right there followed by chapter 3, wait for Christ to come back. Chapter 10, how would it be any different? Same guy doing the preaching. Same guy doing the preaching. Same guy doing the preaching. Look in chapter 10, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. I've got these things here, this one, two, three, four, five, the waiting on Jesus. There's at least five works of righteousness that it takes to get remission of sins. And I didn't make that up either, did I? Go to First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. He speaks of their inheritance and their salvation from verse 3 on. Notice he, he says, though, about their concerning their salvation. In verse 4, it says, To an inheritance, um, uh, Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, that, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith. Now, I'll tell you something. Most denominationalists who don't want Peter and Paul to have preached something different, they chop that verse right off there. No, they don't. I don't mean they throw it away. They don't throw it away. But that's all, what they teach about. They teach the kept, kept by the power of God, kept by the power of God, kept by the power of God. They're letting people believe that what, that what was kept by the power of God was their salvation. That's not true. The promise that was granted unto them, the promise unto them, what did the promise have to do with? It had to do with getting their sins blotted out. Did they have their sins blotted out? No, because they had to repent, get baptized, save themselves from an untoward generation, sell out, have all things common, but then wait for Christ to come back. That's the works of righteousness of Acts chapter 10. How do I know that? Just keep reading in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says uh, in verse Five, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. 
not salvation we have, ready to be revealed in the last time. Keep reading. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if, you, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Keep reading. Whom having not seen, you love, and whom though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Watch. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of of your souls. Were they saved here? Were they saved here? Was Cornelius saved here in Acts chapter 10? No. Salvation's over here when Christ comes back. What did they do here? Works of righteousness to be accepted of him over here. I didn't make any of those phrases up. Keep reading. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us did they, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you, with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desired to look into, nobody was no one was understanding. It was like the angels were looking around in the heavens saying, Where's this guy Jesus? Keep reading. Verse 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. How can any of these people right here be saved? You just got the formula. They're going to be saved by the application of of the atoning power of Jesus Christ's blood, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And Acts chapter 3, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when Jesus comes back. Wow. Look in Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3, verse 1. Hebrews 3, 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, and it's Hebrew, and Hebrew talking to Hebrews, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. Now watch. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, these Hebrews, whose house are we, now watch, if... We hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. What if they didn't? Keep reading. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you'll, harden, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of, of temptation in the wilderness. What happened then? Many of them died. How did they die? Saved or lost? They died lost. Your fathers tempted me and proved me and said, and saw my works 40 years. Verse 10. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, said they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. What do you think that would have cost these people? Based on chapter 6, it's going to cost them their salvation. Watch this next verse. For we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. There it is. It's when Christ comes back. So, well, these guys weren't going to live that long. Then to the end, he that endures to the end, for these people over here from Matthew 24 on, to the end of the time Peter and the 12 apostles preached, holding out to the end meant death. I, I, I reckon it did. They're not still alive. 
No one saw them going to heaven the way five or 500 or more saw Jesus Christ go into heaven. I'm sorry, 120 or more saw Jesus go into heaven. They died like the Old Testament saints back here. Hebrews chapter 11 says, these all died in faith. Well, bless your soul, these all died in faith too. Ever how many there were who held out to the end. Now go back to Matthew 12. Matthew 12. There gets to be some question practically every week. about Paul. The question is, generally speaking, was Paul the 12th apostle? And I don't mean that's the question they ask. That's not the question they ask. But that's what they want to know. They, <laughs> they may not even know they want it. What they want to know is, how does Paul fit into this picture? Well, I got good news for you. He doesn't. Paul is not one of these people. He's not out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's not in the first eight chapters of the book of Acts in the good light. And he's not in this resurrection over here where they're going to get their sins blotted out. Here's why. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Jesus is talking. A great dissertation. Verse 31. Jesus says, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Well, Jesus spoke of two worlds many times. He spoke of this world right there, and he left the 12 apostles in this world. And he spoke of the world to come. This one over here. And I'll just put in parentheses, T-O, C-O-M-E, to come. The world to come, right there. A blasphemer of the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven in this world, but he can't be forgiven in this world to come. Now notice chapter 7. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 7. Look in Acts 7. Stephen speaks practically the whole chapter, and as he ends his sermon, just before they throw rocks at him until he's dead, verse 51, he says to all of the Israel that is listening to him, and I have no idea how many it was, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. You know what blasphemy is? It is resistance. It is a resistance to the truth or of the truth. It is to speak against or to stand against. You do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. And he goes on. Notice now, verse 58. People cry, on, uh, uh, cry at Stephen and run upon him. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. That's 57. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. That's a pretty strong stand against Stephen. Oh, Stephen? Oh, yeah, Stephen. Stephen, in chapter 6, verse 3, was to be one of this seven men full of the Holy Ghost. And when it names Stephen, it says, he is a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And it says of his faith and power, Stephen did great wonders and miracles among the people, and all the, all the uh, great orators of the time stood up against him, and it says they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. And he spoke to the crowd of those who would resist the Holy Ghost, and bam, Saul is right in the middle of the whole passage resisting the Holy Ghost. Chapter 8, verse 1, and Saul was consenting unto his death. Verse 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. When he talks about it later, he said, I did this a lot, Lord. <laughs> verse 9, I mean chapter 9. In chapter 9, verse 1, and Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, which were all filled with the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 4, verse 31. He's breathing out threatenings and slaughter. Would you say that included any blasphemy? Yes, of course it did. And then it says he desired of him letters. He had written down letters that he could 
he could gather them up or kill them if he had to. This man was a horrible, horrible blasphemer against the Holy Ghost. Well, then he wasn't saved in this world. If he was, Jesus would be a liar. And he wasn't saved in this world. If he was, Jesus would be a liar. Where was he saved? He was saved in the world that you live in. He was saved in the world that you live in. Chapter 9. Verse 3, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord told him to go, and it would be told him what he was going to do. Later in this chapter, a man named Ananias goes in, lays his hands on him that he might, re, he, he might receive his sight back and baptized him. People say, well, see, Paul was baptized. He's baptized by a man who only knew this right here. Repent, get baptized, save yourself. You know, that's what the man knew. What did you expect him to do when he went in there? He didn't even want to go. The Lord compelled him to go, and he goes in there, and he touched him, and he's received his sight. And he, 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 all, the only thing Ananias knew to do was to baptize him. Now notice, go to Acts, Acts chapter 22. When Paul retells the story and what he says about Ananias, Acts 22. He's talking, by the way, to a, to a crowd of Jews. They don't like him very well. Acts 22 he gives his testimony, and then he talks about when Ananias got there to him. Verse 12. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law. A devout man in Acts chapter 9 according to the law. Was Ananias keeping the law? Yes, he was. Was he a devout man at it? Yes, he was. Having a good report uh, of all the Jews which dwelt there. He would have had to have known of John's baptism and the, and the commandment of the twelve to, bab to repent and be baptized, for that's what he did with him when he was there. Notice he says here, And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him. Now watch, Ananias is talking. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldst know his will, and see that just one, and shouldst hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. Now Ananias said that to him in Acts chapter 9. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick a 9 right in there. We'll try to get that as dark as possible. To show the time frame of the Apostle Paul getting saved, when Ananias said those words to him that you just read right there. Now, from here on then, Saul does what the Lord wants him to do. In Acts chapter 9, he, was, uh, he evidently went to uh, Arabia for three years and then comes to Jerusalem. That don't work out too well, so he goes down to the town he's from during this time frame of Acts chapter 10. And then Acts chapter 11, Cornelius went down there and got him. Go to Acts chapter 11. Cornelius goes, well, skip, skip the why. You can read that on your own. But he has a reason to go down there and get him, and it has to do with who's being preached to in Antioch. This is in Antioch, and it says in verse 19, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians. Oh, spake unto the Grecians, not to the Jews only. They spake unto the Grecians, and many of them turned to the Lord. Now, the people in, in Jerusalem hear about it, and they send Barnabas to find out what's going on. They told him to go as far as Antioch. But after he sees what's going on, look what he does. Verse 23, Barnabas now. Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, 
and much people were added to the Lord, was added to the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. That'll be Paul. Seek Saul. Why is he going after Saul? He was sent over there by Jerusalem. Barnabas, from Acts chapter 4 on, it says he was filled with the Holy Ghost. This says he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And instead of going back to Jerusalem and telling the apostles what happened over there, he went to Tarsus and got Saul and brought him back there. And Saul taught the brethren there for a year. Now, we can Acts chapter 13. Saul's name is changed to Paul in Acts chapter 13, verse 9. Another great story, which we'll pick up on maybe next week. In Acts chapter 13, he's preaching a long sermon in Antioch in Pisidia. This would be up in Gentile country. Notice he says in verse 38, he says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Did you hear Peter preach that in Acts 2, 3, or 10? Did Ananias tell Paul that on the road to Damascus? Where did Paul get this message? He says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him, Jesus Christ, all that believe are justified from all things. Justified from all things, does that sound like repent and be baptized? Justified from all things, does that sound like wait for Jesus to come back? Justified from all things, does that sound anything like you're going to save yourself from an untoward generation? He that, uh, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Where did Paul get this gospel he just preached? Go to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 1. Bless your soul, he got it from a great source. Read with me from verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul referred to the gospel that he preached as the gospel of Christ, I can't remember if it's 16 or 18 times, something like that. I've got that piece of paper in here somewhere, but nevertheless, lots of times. The gospel of Christ. Notice now verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me, that would be that gospel of Christ, is not after man. For I, never re I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. He didn't ask the 12 apostles for it. They didn't give it. You know why? They didn't have it. Did you read it? Did you read with me in 1 Peter chapter 1? Did you look in uh, uh, Matthew, uh, the references we made to Re Matthew? Did you see in Acts chapter 2 that Peter preached this gospel of Christ? It's not there. How about chapter 3? No. That's when he tells them they're going to have to wait till Jesus comes back to get their sins blotted out. Paul said, through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and all that believe are justified from all things from which you cannot be justified by the law of Moses. And he called that gospel the gospel of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in 1 Corinthians 15, he says in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you, the gospel which I preached unto you. He was there in Acts chapter 18 for about 18 months. Which also you received, and wherein you stand, verse 2, by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised again the third day, according to the scriptures. Keep that gospel in mind and look now, if you will, in Romans chapter 4. Romans 4. In Romans 4, he is making a notation, if you will, about Abraham and his faith, comparing it to Christ and his faith. 
the faith of Christ and the faith of Abraham. That's the correlation here. Notice that verse um, 21 be a reference to Abraham and being fully persuaded that what he, God, had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it, being fully persuaded in his mind, it, his belief, his faith, was imputed to him for righteousness. Verse 23, now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it, the righteousness, shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. That would be the same gospel that he preached in Antioch in Pisidia in Acts 13, verse 38 and 39. The same gospel that he quoted in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4. The same gospel that Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, he never got from a man, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Go back to Romans chapter 1. In Romans 1, he says in verse 15, So as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What kind of salvation is this? Wow. Pretty good. Look, if you will, in Romans 8. Romans 8. Verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Wow! To walk after the, the Spirit? Is that what it takes, to walk after the Spirit? So people say, what do I got to do? What do I got to do? What do I got to do? No, 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 no. You walk in this world after the Spirit, has come upon you. Look in chapter uh, uh, 8, verse, um, verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Ah, walking after the Spirit. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, and, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. You've got righteousness. Oh, yeah. Go back to chapter 3. This, these people didn't have. They were waiting for it. Look in chapter 3, Romans 3, verse 21. Verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Now watch this, which is the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all. Nobody's sins are in their way. Keep reading. And then it says, and upon all them that believe. Upon all them that believe. Go to Romans chapter 8 again and look at Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What shall we say then? I'm sorry. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, <coughs> who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why would that be? Why would it be today that in what Paul wrote in Romans 5, Lehman, and what Paul taught in the book of Acts, it is believe on 
the Lord Jesus Christ, as he told that Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now notice, in uh, the book of Romans, we've just finished up with, verse, with chapter 8, verse 39. We didn't get there, did we? Yes, we did. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1. How does this salvation come to us? Do we repent? Do we get baptized? Do we attempt to save ourselves from an untoward generation? Boy, you couldn't find a more untoward generation than this one. Amen? Do we sell out and have all things common? There have been people who tried that. It didn't last very long. Is there any waiting for Christ to forgive us of our sins? Or did Paul said, say, you know, through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Is that what Paul said? Yes, it is. Look in Ephesians 1. Verse 12 says that we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. And that's a key word, trusted. Verse 13. In whom ye, these Ephesians, in whom ye also trusted. Watch this. After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. I don't see a seal. I don't feel a seal. How do I know I'm sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise? Paul said, I couldn't lose it in Romans chapter 8. There is no condemnation in Romans chapter 8 verse 1. Can't be thrown out of the love of, Christ with, uh, love of God which is in Christ Jesus in verse 39. I don't walk after the flesh, but walk after the Spirit. How can I lose it? The only way I could lose it if it was all left up to me. If it was left up to me, how long do you think I'd have stayed saved and, uh, when I was 22 years old? Not very long. What's this say? It says, in whom all you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Now look in chapter 4, Ephesians 4. Verse 30 says, And grieve to save people, to save people, Paul said, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. How long is your seal going to last, folks? Unto the day of redemption. What's he going to do on the day of redemption? He's going to redeem you. He's going to take you out of here. He's going to get you out of this wacky world. So, how did you get this seal? You believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you do all these things like Peter said to do? No. Was Peter wrong? No. Peter and Paul didn't preach the same gospel. They weren't talking to the same crowd. And they have different inheritances. Hmm. Peter had the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Matthew chapter 16. Paul had the gospel of Christ, the power of God and salvation. Things that are different should never be thought of as being the same. And by the way, if you want to study the word of God honestly, don't try to make them match let the words say what they say. And yes, it is a dispensational viewpoint. But it is, as you can see here tonight, I hope you can see I didn't make up a dispensational theology here. I just read Scripture. Just read Scripture. The people that Paul preached to were called the church, the body of Christ. The people that Peter preached to were called the kingdom disciples. And they preach a gospel of the kingdom in accordance with what Jesus told them in Matthew 24. This gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world, and then shall the end come. Well, it never has been. As a matter of fact, you can't find any possibility of any of the 12 apostles except for John the Baptist, and perhaps not even him, had ever left Jerusalem after A.D. 67. So how is it going to be that anyone would understand what Paul said versus what Peter said? Let them be different. Why? Because they are different. 
Why let them be different? Did the Lord call upon you to change his word or to believe it? Did the Lord call upon you to be sure that men understand it the way you think they ought to understand it or just let it say what it says? I hope this has been helpful to you tonight. Next week we'll go through a similar thing, only from a different viewpoint, about the differences between what Peter and Paul preached and where we are today and why. I thank you for, very much for being here tonight. I appreciate it. And um, we will be, Lord willing, be back here next uh, Monday night. We are going to be driving up to Indiana on the weekend for my sister's 90th birthday and, uh, and a, a big probably brouhaha party going on up there. Who knows what will go on at that wild and crazy 90-year-old party. But nevertheless, gonna be, it's going to be wonderful to see her. She's a loving woman. I've, I've, I've loved her all my life. I love her today. And um, I look forward to being with her. And um, uh, then uh, I don't know what time we'll get home, but we'll be here Monday night, Lord willing. Th same thing will take place. And maybe just some more scripture be unfolded for us. I thank you, and good night, everyone. We're going to take the uh, recording off now, and uh, then we'll just... Uh